Hi everyone, and welcome to the six factors to get the best aqueous cleaning results. We are excited to be speaking with you today and appreciate you taking the time to join us. My name is Christy Hanasek, Senior Marketing Specialist at Magnaflux, and I'll be facilitating today's webinar. Any questions during today's presentation, please feel free to email them to support at magnaflux.com and a member of our team will reach out to you in the next 24 hours. All right, now the moment we've all been waiting for. Without further ado, let's meet today's speakers, Sean Kilty and Greg Burdick, who collectively have over 40 years of NDT experience. Sean, would you like to introduce yourself? Thanks, Christy. Um, hi, I'm Sean Kilty. Um, I've been with Magnaflux for 22 years um, in a number of a variety of roles. Um, currently, I'm the uh, Division Research and Development Manager. Hi, Greg Burdick. I'm the Northeast Regional Sales Manager for Magnaflux uh, North America, which involves US and Canada. Um, <clears throat> been with Magnaflux for eight years now with a little over 23 years of NDT experience. Basically today we're going to just uh, discuss um, why cleaning matters and then we'll also get into the advantages and disadvantages of aqueous cleaning. So uh, one of the things we um, want to uh, stress today is that um, with aqueous cleaning, there's no one size fits all. Um, before we get into aqueous cleaning, just a little bit of um, history in, in industrial cleaning. Um, aqueous clean is really uh, the dominant uh, cleaning method now, but that wasn't always the case. Um, going back into the late 90s um, and beyond, uh, solvent cleaning was actually the most popular cleaning method um, using a, a method called vapor degreasing. Um, that predates me a little bit, but uh, from what I'm told, everybody loved vapor degreasing, uh, basically because it was easy and it worked really good. And um, unfortunately, the solvents that were used in vapor degreasing, lots of them were um, either hazardous to the operators or hazardous to the environment. And a lot of the most popular solvents were uh, responsible for causing a lot of damage to the ozone layer. And uh, accordingly, they were either heavily restricted or uh, banned altogether. And so when solvents went away, that's when the industry moved to aqueous cleaning. Because of the history with vapor degreasing, everybody wanted aqueous cleaning to kind of work the same way, where it was really easy, um, and, and aqueous cleaning isn't quite like that. It's a little bit more complicated. Um, it does have the advantage of being safer, uh, both for the operators and for the environment, but it does have the disadvantage of uh, being a little bit more difficult. Um, and that's why we're here today. We're gonna talk through aqueous cleaning and um, hopefully kind of uh, uh, simplify that by talking about the key characteristics of a, a good aqueous cleaning method. So here's what we describe as the uh, cleaning equation. Um, these first four uh, characteristics of a, a cleaning application, agitation, chemistry, temperature, and time, those can all be modified to optimize a, a cleaning application. So um, increasing agitation may um, allow you to do cleaning faster to decrease time. Uh, changing chemistry, may uh, allow you to use less agitation. So all of these, these first four things all work together to get the parts clean. Uh, and then there's a, the final two steps of rinsing and drying. And hopefully at the end of that, we end up with clean parts. Um, as I said, uh, aqueous cleaning can be uh, uh, so somewhat complicated, um, but I, I guess I would remind everybody that in our personal lives, we all do aqueous cleaning. Um, we uh, clean our, our our house, we clean, we do dishes, um, we do laundry, uh, we clean our homes, we clean our person, we wash our hands. So all of us have a lot of experience with aqueous cleaning. And so when we, we talk about these different parameters, um, I think we can think of it in terms of the cleaning that we all do in our personal lives. So um, like with our dishwasher, the the spray bars that are spraying water onto the onto the dishes, that's providing agitation. Um, the agitator in a, a laundry machine, uh, moving the clothes back and forth, that's all providing agitation to liberate the soils from the fabric. Um, 
with chemistry. Uh, I can remember when I was a, a kid, um, you know, my parents sending me off to wash my hands before dinner or whatever and, and yelling at me to use soap um, because they would they knew that left to my own devices, I might skip that step. And, you know, I think my, my parents were onto something. Um, if you look at most of the, the aqueous clean we do, there is a, a, a detergent or soap that's involved because it dramatically affects the, the, the outcome of that, the cleaning process. Um, temperature, um, dishwashers run really hot because that's uh, the best way to get dishes clean to, to deal with those soils. Uh, with laundry, we have to choose which which temperature setting to, to, to wash our clothes on. Um, when it comes to time, um, I'm sure all of us have heard uh, during the pandemic, um, uh, washing our hands, we should wash with warm water and soap and wash for 20 seconds. So there's a very specific time limit, um, our, 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 our time parameter around that cleaning. So uh, again, we're all doing aqueous cleaning all the time and so it shouldn't be as much of a mystery as I think it sometimes is. So now we're going to go through each of these characteristics individually and, and give you a little bit more detail on each of them. One of the first um, things that we have to look at when looking at uh, aqueous cleaning is um, the agitation. When we're looking at a, as a system, uh, as explained in one of the first slides, agitation um, is where we start our cleaning process. Basically what that is, the physical action of moving either the cleaner around the part or the part in the cleaner. Um, basically what that's going to do is to help us um, loosen up any of the um, oils or um, soils on the part. Um, there are many types of agitation starting with soaking basically here it's just as explained basically taking the part and soaking it in your solution um, this can take uh, a much longer time because there is no um, physical per se uh, action it's just soaking the part in the solution the second would be the hand wiping now here it's much more la labor intensive and it's very time consuming so again, we need to determine what would work best for our application, depending on the geometry of the part, as well as the solutions we're using. Um, sprays, um, pretty much as Sean had mentioned, um, sprays here, you could go with something that is very similar to a dishwasher or laundry machine, basically where the solution is being sprayed onto the part to loosen the soils, and to clean um, oils and soils off the parts. And last but not least, um, ultrasonic cleaning. Ultrasonics, basically here we're taking sound waves, which create very microscop uh, very small microscopic bubbles that are used to virtually scrub the part clean. Um, when you get into the sprayers and ultrasonic cleaners now here, you have some higher costs for equipment, which at times could be capital equipment expenditures, which would take time to um, get that type of investment approved. Um, but they also will shorten the cleaning process and um, give you higher throughput uh, for your parts. Uh, so the next characteristic we want to talk about is chemistry. Um, so when we talk about chemistry, there's there's two things, um, the type of cleaner and the usage concentration for that cleaner. Uh, I think the first thing that we want to think about when we, we uh, look at the chemistry for an application is the, the type of parts that are being cleaned, um, specifically the alloy that they're made of. Um, really what we want to do is, is um, we don't want to do any harm. And so, um, you know, some cleaners can be aggressive. Some cleaners can be used on certain alloys, and not on others. So that's a key consideration. Uh, the next thing to consider is the type of soil being removed from those parts. So is it a heavy grease or oil or is it a shop dirt or, or a, a light soil? And so those are the, the two kind of key characteristics to think about when we talk about chemistry. Um, when it comes to aqueous cleaning, there's basically, um, well, there's lots of chemistries out there, lots of types of, of chemicals, but we're talking about uh, general purpose cleaning. Uh, there's basically three types. Uh, neutral cleaners have a pH between seven and nine. 
alkaline cleaners, um, which have a pH between 9 and 12, and heavy duty cleaners, which uh, have a, a pH of, of 12 or better. Um, when choosing amongst these cleaners, um, it's, it's a, a compromise between um, how gentle the cleaner is on the parts and how aggressive it is towards the soil that you're trying to clean off. So if you have a, um, let's say you have a, um, a delicate alloy, uh, magnesium, for example, that's um, susceptible, easily susceptible to, to chemical attack, um, a neutral cleaner is a better choice for that. Um, now, when it comes to soils, the opposite is true. Um, if it's a heavy soil, you want a heavy duty cleaner. Um, a neutral cleaner may not be able to clean off a, a, a really tough soil. So those are the things to think about as, as you think about chemistry. Um, choosing a cleaner and also on concentration. So um, lower concentrations will be gentler on parts, um, but won't give you as much cleaning power. Um, heavier concentrations will give you more cleaning power, but increase the likelihood of, of, of uh, uh, damaging the parts or, or, or changing the surface of the parts. Um, higher the temperature will increase the efficiency of your cleaning solution. Um, pretty much the same as when you're washing dishes. Uh, the warmer or hotter the water, the easier um, the uh, particles from your dishes will, will clean off. So in general, uh, you're better off with higher temperatures. Um, they'll um, release the, uh, the soils quicker and easier. Um, the reaction between the solution and the soil will, will occur faster when running at higher temperatures. Temperature also affects the property of the soils, so the um, temperature will increase the viscosity of the soils, um, it will, excuse me, will decrease the viscosity of the soils so that they will come off the part uh, much easier. However, when you're dealing with um, temperatures you do also have some disadvantages. Basically you have um, higher equipment costs because now you have to have heaters built in to the cleaner, uh, the cleaning tanks, and you also will have um, higher operating costs and maintenance costs. Here you can also see damages to parts if you're increasing the heat too much um, and too quickly. You could um, be too aggressive and uh, again start uh, damaging the parts by etching them or uh, possible corrosion and um, it can also create residue on the part. Um, other disadvantage is the, the fact that at higher temperatures particularly above 125 degrees F or 50 degrees C you're going to start seeing more evaporation so your concentrations may need to be adjusted uh, more often and uh, materials added as needed to the tanks. The next characteristic we need to think about is, is time. Um, the amount of time that the, the parts are in the cleaning solution. Um, for most manufacturing facilities, time is money. Um, trying to um, push through parts as quickly as possible. Um, measuring uh, output through um, how many parts go out the door. So uh, typically we try and minimize the amount of time that uh, operations take. And um, however, with time, um, uh, time can be a good way to deal with tough cleaning applications. So I'd mentioned earlier that um, when it comes to chemistry, um, you know, it's a balance of uh, not damaging the part, but having enough cleaning power to clean off the soil. So that really the toughest cleaning um, applications are where you're dealing with a, a delicate alloy but a tough soil and time can help with those situations. Um, I, I guess I would relate this again back to washing dishes. Um, if you think if you have a, a pot or pan that has uh, baked on stuff on it, um, for me what I, I do is um, I'll, I'll let that soak. I'm sure a lot of people do too and uh, to be honest not everybody in my household agrees with that uh, technique, but it's one that I found good. Um, saves me a lot of elbow grease and um, you know, I can get the get the dishes clean um, without having to scrub and scrub and scrub on them. So time is good for that. It can help us with um, with difficult applications. 
So that brings us back to the cleaning equation. And so um, again, these first four parameters where we can adjust all of those to to give us the to optimize our cleaning application. Um, if we're trying to go fast, we can increase agitation. We can use stronger chemistry, stronger concentrations, higher temperatures to move faster. Um, if we have delicate alloys, we may take more time so we can operate at lower temperatures and with gentler cleaning, cleaners, less agitation. So from here we get into rinsing. OK, now that we've cleaned the part, we want to uh, make sure that it's rinsed properly and thoroughly. So <clears throat> basically here um, we want to make sure that we're rinsing enough um, to remove the soils and the cleaner. Um, it's very important to make sure that we rinse as quickly as possible after we've uh, done our cleaning uh, to avoid any um, redeposits of um, any soils, oils, or contamination on the part. Also to make sure that we're getting any cleaner off the part so that we're no longer uh, cleaning the part, which could cause to etching or uh, corrosion of the part. Um, here we also want to make sure that we're using a clean water so that we don't leave um, water marks on the part and that we have a nice clean part moving to the next process. So the final phase of the cleaning process is drying. Um, should not forget about that with aqueous cleaning. Um, the water left on the part can actually become a problem. Um, part of the reason for that is that um, the, the corrosion inhibitors that are in the cleaner are really designed to protect the part while it's in the cleaning solution. So when we go through the rinse phase, the corrosion inhibitors are effectively rinsed off, leaving, leaving the part susceptible to corrosion. So the drying step becomes very, very critical because of that. We don't want to leave the, the, the part unprotected. Um, we'll see that sometimes um, with, uh, with um, customers having issues with, with uh, corrosion after the cleaning process. And you can see that there was a spot where water had pooled and um, it was tough to get it dry and, and the, the part uh, rusted there. And so uh, drying is a very important part. It helps protect the parts and uh, helps avoid corrosion. So some of the advantages of, of drying, obviously, it uh, prevents corrosion. Um, you can uh, eliminate residue that may um, adversely affect um, uh, downstream processes. Um, there's a number of ways to do that. So uh, ovens are the most common, but uh, air hoses or knives are also used. Um, Drawing does add a cost, so there's a, some disadvantage to um, it takes time. Um, and then the, the heat can be a, a potential issue too, as far as uh, damage to the part, depending on the, the type of part and the, the temperature which drying is done. Thank you, Sean and Greg, for your insight and taking us through the six factors to get the best aqueous cleaning results. As a reminder, if you had any questions during this presentation or need help determining the best cleaner for your application, please feel free to contact support at magnaflux.com or your local distributor. This concludes today's webinar. Thank you again for attending. And we hope you have a wonderful day.